Hello. Good morning, everyone. Today's another beautiful day that God has made. It's a Sunday. It's almost August, believe it or not. <laughs> but I'm glad that I have breath this morning. I'm glad that I'm awake. I'm glad that I get this other day, this another chance to worship the Lord while I'm here on earth. You know what a privilege it is to worship the Lord, especially with all the things that are maybe going on, circumstances. Such a joy, such a privilege to worship God here on earth, especially because when we go to heaven, there's going to be no pain, no suffering, no sorrow, no tears. That means we get this one life here on earth to worship Him through our pain, through our suffering, through our sorrows, whatever it may be. And I think that is the best way to show God how much you love Him. To show Him how much He really means to you. To show Him how worthy He is as we worship Him. So let's all close our eyes this morning. Let's go into a time of prayer before worship. Father, we come before you. We thank you for blessing this day. This day that you have created specifically for each one of us. Father, we are here today as your children. We are here ready to worship you, ready to praise you, ready to sing of your, your greatness, your goodness, God. You are so worthy. So, Father, as we worship you this morning, may you receive our worship as a pleasing aroma. And I pray that as we sing to you, God, that it may be from our hearts, that it may be in spirit and in truth as we praise you, God. Because you deserve the highest praise. So, Father, remind us again and again and again why we worship you. Because of the price that you paid for us. We don't even deserve it, but God, you, you've given it us freely, graciously. And because of this, we worship you, our King, who has redeemed us and set us free, God. We worship you. We worship you. So, Father, may all glory and honor be unto your name this morning. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Sing how great the chasm. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I did not climb in desperation. I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end Jesus Christ, my living God. Who could imagine? Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages. To wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living Praise the one who set me free. 
Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. The morning that sealed the promise, your very body began to breathe out of the silence. The Lord will lie declare the faith has no claim on you. Sing that again. Then came the morning. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe out of the
things All of my games now fade away Every crown no longer on Your presence. Heaven is trembling in all your wonders. The kings and their kingdoms are standing amazed. Here in your presence. Here in your presence, heaven and earth become one. Here in your presence, all things are new. Here in your presence, everything bows before. of joy, every fear suddenly wide, here in your presence, all of my gains now fade away, every crown no longer on
listen to your word, as your presence is among us, Father, we ask that we may pursue you with our hearts this morning, that, our, that the ears of our hearts may be open, that our hearts may be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, to everything that you want to speak to us today, God. We welcome you, Lord. And Father, we pray, we pray that our hearts are good soil this morning. As we receive your word, let it grow and multiply hundred times fold. We thank you, Lord. We praise you for who you are. We love you, God. There is no other like you. You have no rival, no equal. And we worship you alone, our living hope. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Caleb, for the wonderful worship. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to our Sunday service this morning. It's good to see all of you. We are here to praise God. We are here to listen to God's words. So let us prepare our hearts. Let us get ready. Let us get ready to let God speak to us. Let God talk to us. Today, I want to talk to you about overcoming. We will overcome. Be an overcomer in everything that you do in your lives. Okay, so let us pray. Let us begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you with all of our hearts. Father, we thank you because we know that you love us so much that you will never leave us. You will always be there for us. No matter what the situation is, you will always be there. And no matter how much we turn away from you, how much we rebel against you, Father, we know that you wait patiently for our return. So Father, we thank you. We thank you that we know that in this chaotic world that you are in charge, you know everything, everything is under your control. So we are not to fear. We just need to trust in you. Father, we know that you will provide. You will provide for the protection and for the, uh, for the healing of those who are affected by the virus. <clears throat> we will also pray for those people who are affected uh, by the chaotic events in this world. Father, we know that you will be there for all Christians and for those who will come to believe in you. Father, we, we pray that the Holy Spirit will guide us and lead us and teach us today we're going to talk about spiritual battle again 
But more importantly, we're gonna really understand how to win, how to overcome, how to defeat Satan at his game. Thank you so much. We pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Okay, brothers and sisters, if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 12. We're going to read the whole chapter. It's going to be, it's going to be on, the, uh, on the screen, but it's going to be kind of small. Font of 28 may be difficult to read, uh, or you got to get closer to the screen. All right. So last week, I talked about spiritual battle from Ephesians. Today, I'd like to continue that talk. Our scripture today is from Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. You know, I love, I love this book. I love the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 12 is fascinating. It is a exciting, exciting book to read. Revelation has lots of imageries and lots of prophetic promises. Imageries that will surprise you, excite you, or promises that will bring comfort to our hearts. You know, we are living in a day when most people deny the real cost and the real problems that we face in this world. We don't want to see the result that's in our world is really caused by sin, by our sin. Oh, 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 sorry. You don't have that. By our sin and by the devil himself. Yet this is exactly what we see happening as the author of sin is on the war path. And we are his targets. Satan is here to destroy us. He is here to make sure we don't follow what God wants us to do. Our scripture today talks about dragons. Dragons are mythical creatures that haunt cultures from every civilization. If you look at the dragons there, there is a Babylonian dragon there. There is a Chinese dragon there, and there's a European dragon there. You probably could guess which is which. And long ago, when you see maps, maps are made by these individuals where they would put dragons everywhere on these maps, most likely because some of them have met dragons in their life. And I believe those are probably dinosaurs. You know, I am in the camp that believe dinosaurs actually live with people not billions of years ago. Today, dragons are fairy tales, books, and movies. But dragon that we're looking at today from the book of Revelation is very different. He is real, he's been around a long time, and he's just as deadly and diabolical as he's ever been. Dragon of the revelation. He is a monster behind all the monsters that we know. The ultimate horror of the universe. This monster, this dragon, wages war right now against Israel, against Jesus Christ, and of course against you and I. So in our time together, in the next 30 to 40 minutes or so, I like to look at how Lucifer how Lucifer wages war. Lucifer is the Satan, who is also the dragon, who wages war on us. The war that he wages. But we're going to also look more importantly, how do we overcome that? How do we overcome the war that Lucifer wages against us? So let's read. Let's read the scripture. It's a very long read. Again, if you have your Bible, you can turn to it. If not, then look at the PowerPoint. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed in, with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she walked about to give, to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, 
an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns. It's so small at that point. And seven crowns on its head. It's all, its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male son, who will rule all the nation with an iron scepter, and her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan who leads the world, whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah for the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore, rejoice, you heavens and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who gave birth to the male child. The woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness where she would be taken care of for a time, times and a half a time out of the serpent's reach. Then from his mouth, the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. But the earth held the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring. Those who keep God's command and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. Satan wages war against heaven and earth. The first war that Satan waged is against Israel and the Messiah. This dragon stands in front of the woman, waiting to devour the child as soon as he's born. Suddenly the pain increases and the child enters the world. But before the dragon can destroy the child, he is snatched up and taken to heaven, to God's throne. And the woman flees into the desert to a refuge prepared by God for 1,260 days. What does this all mean? To begin to understand Revelation, you must understand that the book of Revelation is about the past, about the present, and about the future. So the wars, the verses that you read, encompass the past, the present, and the future, all playing out before your eyes. In this chapter, there are three main characters. The first one is the woman. The woman is Israel. The woman, John says in verse 1 that you see here, a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed, clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. Verse 1. This parallel Joseph's dream back in Genesis. Remember, Joseph had a dream 
In his dream, his father was the sun, the mother was the moon, and his brothers, the 11 brothers, 12 including himself, are the stars. So the 12 stars you see in verse 1 represents the 12 tribes of Israel. So the woman in these verses, again, represents Israel. The second character is, of course, the child. Who is the child? The child is, of course, Jesus. Jesus. The male child is Jesus, the Messiah. Verse 5, verse 5 says, She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The iron scepter comes right out of Psalm 2, verse 9. Speaking about the Messiah, who shall be king, who is one, no one less than son, the son of God. It says of him, you will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Them are the nations that rise against God and the Messiah. The kind of rod that we're talking about here is a shepherd's rod. But instead of making it out of wood, it's making it out of iron. It means that this shepherd is very strong, very strong. Jesus spoke of himself as the good shepherd, as a good shepherd. But remember, he is also very powerful because of this iron rod. Note that it says her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. John is compacting the entire life and the ministry of Jesus Christ into three events, his birth, his death, and his resurrection, and his ascension into heaven. The child is Jesus Christ, the Messiah. The dragon, the next character is the dragon. The dragon is Satan. And you all know this. The dragon is described in verse 3. Then another sign appeared in heaven, the enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its head. Because of its head, horns and crown, some, think, some people think this is the Antichrist that will come during the tribulation. But John tells us exactly who this person is. In verse 9, the great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray, he was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. Well, this may seem to be like the Antichrist, but I believe is referring to Satan. Satan is strong, everybody. Know that he is strong and he is deadly. The seven represents the completeness of his strength. Ten is the number of authority. So he is strong and he is cunning. And we need to be careful of him. And he wages war against us. He wages war against God. So it's a war against the woman, against Israel, in the attempt to stop and destroy the male child who is Jesus. But before he could succeed, before Satan could succeed, Jesus was caught up to heaven where he is now at the right hand of God and he is coming again to put all things right. That is to put devil in its place. And where is that? In hell and in the lake of fire. So when, what we are seeing here is the woman flees into the desert to take refuge prepared by God. Jesus said that when, Jew, when the Jews who remain after we are raptured, when they see the abomination of desolation, they will flee. They will flee for 100, uh, 1,260 days. That's the time and the time and a half that you read in the verse. It's three and a half years. That's the second half of the tribulation. Again, for us Christians, we are not here to witness that. But the Jewish people will be here to experience this tribulation. But God will protect them. Ever, ever there were people who are under the persecution of the world and hounded and hated, 
it is Israel. You know, Satan, Satan has tried so many ways to get rid of Israel. Satan has tried all his different ways, and I'm only showing you three historical ways Satan has attempted to erase Israel off this earth. The first picture is the Greek emperor Antiochus Epiphanes. He's one of the first who's tried to eradicate the Jewish nation. Then came the Caesars of the Roman Empire. Worst is Nero. Nero is one of the worst who tried to eradicate all Christians living on earth. And of course, none other than the hated Hitler, Adolf Hitler, who also tried to erase Israel off the earth. These are the results of Satan's intense hatred of God's chosen people, the Jewish race. Here's the point. Satan could destroy the Jewish people. Why? He wants to. Why does he want to? Because he wants to stop God's plan from being implemented. The Bible is very clear. The promise is very clear. The Jewish people will be saved. They will be saved and they will enter heaven. But Satan wants to prevent that. Satan believes if he could destroy the Israel nation, then God's plan is destroyed. The chosen people are no longer chosen. But God has other plans. God has protected Israel from the old days even to this day now. The dragon expands his war toward the rest of the offsprings, and that is us. Those who obey God and confess Jesus Christ are now his target as well. So not just Israel, but us as well. Revelation 17, our last verse says, Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring. Those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. And that's you and I. That's you and I. Today, we don't really need to look far and just look at our world or society today. Just look at around us today. In our schools, evolution's taught, creation is laughed at. We see all sorts of immorality being taught as being right. We see all biblical moral rights, moral principles are taught as being wrong. And then there are nations turning away from Israel and from Christians, where both are persecuted around the world. And just look at the U.S. God has been taken out of every environment. People want God out. Let me tell you, that is Satan's plan. We need to bring back God into every aspect of our lives. That's the first war. Satan is waging war against Israel, against the Messiah, and against you and I. The second war against heaven. Now, this is way early. This is not chronological. Second war is against heaven. Verse 7 and 8 says this, 7, 8, and 9. Then the war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who led the whole world astray. He was hurled down to earth, as here, you and I are on earth, and his angels, his minions, with him. Michael in the Old Testament is the guardian angel, angel of Israel. So this war has to do with God's people. And the war is between Michael, representing God, and the dragon, again, representing Satan. And Michael and the host of heaven win the battle and cast out Satan and his army, which is one-third of the angels, with Satan. These are so-called fallen angels. And they're the one, together with Satan, causing havoc here on earth. 
because he is hurled down to earth. Now we wonder what weaponry, what does Michael use to win? Does he have bombs, guns? Of course not. Heavenly battle is not won by guns, tanks, airplanes, nothing of that sort. The war for heaven, like the war for human souls, the war for your soul, the war for my soul from, from Satan, is all through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so that's why all heaven cries out in verse 10. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. The second war. Satan has already lost that war against heaven, but now he is on earth to wage the third war against us. The third war against the believers, and that is you and I. Verse 12 says, But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. He's mad because he knows he's losing. Actually, he has already lost. But he doesn't give up. He's pretty persistent. You're going to give him credit for that. He wants to take as many people to hell with him as possible. So he's unleashing his entire army, one-third of the angels, entire arsenal against not only Israel, but believers in Jesus Christ as well. That is you and I. The evil that we see today, understand this. Satan is not winning. You may think he's winning by looking at the things around the world today, but it's quite the opposite. I want you to think of it this way. It's because he's losing that he's throwing everything out. Just like any game, when you're losing at the end, you try everything possible to win the game. And that's what Satan is doing now. All the chaos you're seeing is because he is losing. And that's why he's using, he's enticing a lot of chaos in this world. He doesn't want Jesus to be king. He doesn't want Jesus to come because then he goes to the lake of fire. But you know, it's too late for him. It's too late for him. But he will not end until Jesus comes. Verse 17 again says, The dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring. Again, that's us. Those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. But we must hold God's command dearly and we must hold fast to the testimony of Jesus Christ. Satan couldn't get Israel. He failed each time. Therefore, he's coming against us, believers in Jesus Christ. If you are a believer, a true believer in Jesus Christ, know that Satan is going to attack you with accusations and condemnation. That's who he is. That's what his name means. In the Hebrew, it means accuser. He's the father of lies. He's the accuser. So he's going to take your sins your sins, my sins, and then he's going to continually throw them in your face, as well as doing everything possible to make your life a living hell. He's going to embarrass you, he's going to make you feel bad, and he's going to make you feel like you are not worthy. And he's going to make you doubt. It all started with Adam and Eve. Does God really say no? He's going to make you doubt. And that's Satan's scheme because he doesn't want Jesus to come. Remember last week, the verse I give you, Ephesians 6, 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces 
of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, against this attack, God has given to us what he has given to Michael and his angel. There are tools for us to defeat Satan. We will be overcomers. We will overcome. Remember, we're fighting from victory, not to victory. Understand that. We're fighting from victory, not to victory. Luke chapter 10, verses 18 to 20 says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to cover and to cover all the power, sorry, of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. The salvation God's given us is our guarantee in heaven. That's the life we want. That's the life we're looking forward to. The Lord proclaim victory for his people and give them the tools to overcome. Revelation 12 verse 11 tells us, they triumph over him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Verse 11 is the key to overcome Satan. So I'm going to read it again, and I'm going to give you three things from here. I'm going to read it again. Please follow. They triumph over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. These tools are available for you and I to defeat Satan in his demons, his fallen angels. We can defeat him. First, the blood of the lamb. The blood of the lamb is the blood of Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, an innocent lamb was sacrificed to symbolically pay for people's sin. You will know that it illustrates the destructiveness of sin, that when we sin, Innocent had to pay the price. Blood had to pay for the sins that we've caused. Jesus was the ultimate solution. Only a perfect God could die for others. Only a perfect person can die for the sins of the world. And so the perfect son of God paid for our sin with what? With his blood with his life blood. The blood of Jesus is a weapon that has never lost its power. But, was ne but you know, we as Christians have never learned to use it. We've never learned to use it. Too much of the church of these days, of our generation, have forsaken the blood of Jesus. And we search for more appealing gospel. Gospel that is not really gospels at all. We water down God's teaching. We ignore the blood of Jesus. But let me tell you, the trail of blood runs from Genesis to Revelation. It is necessary. It is the only thing that will bring you salvation, that will help you overcome. There is power in the blood of Jesus. There is power. Satan will be defeated, but Satan will come at you and he will tell you, you can change. You will never be any different. Life will never change. This is what Satan's going to tell you. You're a sinner. You're going to die as a sinner. Satan is going to make you feel so bad. You're going to, some of us may turn away from God, but don't do that. The blood of Jesus redeem us through its power. Verse 7, Ephesians 1, 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. So understand this. Morality may, morality again, may keep you out of jail, but it will not, but it will take the blood 
of Jesus to keep you out of hell. I don't care how good of a person you are, you need the blood of Jesus. You need the blood of Jesus. The apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. It doesn't matter where a person's life is like now. You may be living sinfully. You may have committed many sins. You may have committed sin this morning. But let me tell you, the blood of Jesus can forgive every sin. The blood of Jesus will forgive every sin if you come humbly in repentance and in obedience. Hebrews 9.22, I'm quoting Moses here. Moses says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Jesus had to die. His death brought us salvation. The power of the blood of the Lamb defeats Satan every time, every time. Number two, the word of our testimony. The second tool is the word of our testimony. When we think about testimony, we may think about our lives, the way we lead our lives and how God has helped us successfully overcome the challenges and the difficulties in our, our lives. But you know, prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 64, verse 6 tells us that all of our acts are filthy rags. We are not even righteous. No matter how righteous you try to be, how good you try to be, people say, oh, I'm a good person. No matter how good of a person you try to be, you're just not good enough. You will sin. You will fail. You will still do things against God's will. We will never be good enough to do what God wants us to do. No one is righteous, the Bible says. No one is righteous to make it to heaven on their own. Testimony means this, to be a witness and to give evidence to an experience. What they did was confess their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. With the Lord Jesus Christ. Now when Abraham, Abraham um, wanted to find a wife for Isaac, which was um, uh, Rebecca. Abraham sent the servant called Haram to talk to Sarah. But when, if you look at the Bible, when Haram talked to Sarah, he didn't talk about Abraham. He talks about Isaac, how wonderful Isaac is. And why do I tell you this? I want you to understand our testimony is important. But remember, your testimony focused focuses on Jesus. I've listened to a lot of testimonies people give and their focus is on themselves or how wonderful they were. And God may have changed them, but they talk about themselves all the time. Let me tell you, don't focus on yourself. Your testimony, focus on Jesus. If you had a big change, if you were once a drug addict, don't dwell on how you were a drug addict. Dwell on how Jesus took you out of that sinful life and how Jesus saved you from that sinful life. Focus on Jesus. The word of our testimony is to focus on Jesus. Also, one of the main reasons many believers are, are overcome rather than overcoming is we, we are quick to forget what God has done for us. You know, God has done so much for you, but we never put it in our hearts. We forget them. Overcomer sees their current test as an opportunity for God's power to produce another testimony. Remember, an overcomer, that's what you and I want to become. Not to be overcome, but to overcome our experiences, our test. Because these are opportunity for God's power to manifest in you so that your testimony, testimony again, may be expressed. To the demon-possessed man in Mark chapter 5, 19. I'm sorry, go back. Say with you. 5, 19. The demon-possessed man, Jesus, healed this man in Gerasenes. And the man wants to go with Jesus. Say, can I just follow you? What did Jesus say? Jesus tells this man, go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. 
God wants you to testify for him. Your experience is what God uses for you to testify by the word of God. Jesus overcomes Satan by the word of God. Remember Ephesians 6, last week we kind of read it. One of the main offensive weapons in our battle, in the spiritual battle, is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So we become overcomers by taking the sword out. Battle, battle Satan with the word of God. So the word of our testimony, blood of Jesus Christ, the word of our testimony. Lastly, not loving our lives. Now, this is interesting. Just by reading it, you're going to go, what? What do you mean not loving our lives? Shouldn't we love our lives? Let's understand what God is saying here. Jesus, uh, John, I'm sorry, John the writer of Revelation is telling us that devil is defeated when you and I do not fear death. If we expect to defeat Satan at his own game, we must be willing to suffer. We must be willing to face all inconveniences, put up any hardship, and make any sacrifices in order to further the cost of Jesus Christ in this world, in, on this earth. This is an attitude of an overcomer. We must not fear death. We must not fear Satan's attack. We must not fall back. We must come face to face with him and battle him. A believer's death is not the last word, everyone. My loved ones, the believer's death is not the last word. You know what's the last word? That's when Jesus says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Jesus will say that to you right before we die. Well done, my good and faithful servants. Then we head to heaven. An everlasting life. New physical body. These believers in the Jesus days, they believe, they commit to Jesus all the way. They commit completely, 120%, even to death. Back in those days, you know how many people died for Christ? Not only were they willing to live for the Lord, but they're also willing to die for the Lord. Are you willing to die for our Lord Jesus Christ? Are you willing to make that little bit of a sacrifice for Jesus Christ? Or are you succumbing to this world? Then you're succumbing to Satan's schemes. What must we do? What must we do? You must begin by putting your flesh, the desire of your flesh, to death while you're still alive here on earth. The Apostle Paul tells us in Colossians 3, verses 5 through 9, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry, and he goes on to list other angers, wrath, malice, slander, filthy language, lies, saying, since you have taken off your old self with its practices. I hope that you and I are not ashamed of the gospel. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Don't go with what secular world wants you to be. Don't change with the secular world. It changes all the time. God doesn't change. God will come. It is our duty to exalt Jesus Christ here on earth when we are living. So let me end with this verse. Let me end with this verse. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. The Bible tells us to be alert 
to the presence of our spiritual enemy, the devil. Satan is our enemy in this spiritual battle. Be sober-minded. Be vigilant. Remember, by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony, and by not fearing death, Satan and his angels are already defeated. God will protect you and bless you always. Remember, remember to always remain and be faithful to our Christ, to our Lord Christ Jesus. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much. You've died on that cross for us so that we may receive eternal life. You shed your blood so our sins are forgiven. We are no longer chained by the sins of our lives. We are no longer chained by the sins that we've committed. Father, we need to come before you daily. We need to come before you every day every moment in our lives. We need to repent to you of our sins. We need to eradicate all these evil desires, these fleshly desires that's within us. We need to come back to you. We need your blood to wash us over and over again. Father, help us not to search help elsewhere because the only ultimate help is to come back to you. Your blood is powerful forever. Once and for all, we are saved. Father, help us to be a witness to you. Help us to be brave. Help us to stand firm in our Christian walk. Help us not to shy away when opportunities come for us to make that testimony. Help us to stand firm when people attack you and that we need to stand out and fight for the truth. Father, give us strength, give us wisdom, give us protection. We thank you so much because you were always there. You were always there, be, uh, always there, uh, be for us, fight for us and protect us. We're not afraid because we fight from victory. The battle has already been won. Thank you so much. We pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let us worship. We're going to be singing a new song this morning, <laughs> but um, it's called Into the Battle. as we sing this new song, let's remind our spirits, let's remind ourselves that we are already victorious because Jesus has overcome. Because Jesus has conquered death. Because Jesus reigns and Jesus has the victory. We are on his side. So we have no fear of anything. And we will triumph by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony, and by not loving our lives as to shrink from death. So as we sing this song this morning, even though it's new, let's, let's use this song as a battle cry to cry out, a war cry, and declare that we are victorious in His name. We are victorious when Jesus is for us. We have nothing to fear. PowerPoint to be set up, why don't we just continue to meditate on the word, continue to meditate on what God has spoken to you today. Let's all quiet our hearts.
missing. There's one. There's one who has overcome. Seated on David's throne. Making our enemies a footstool beneath our knees. See that hand is one. There's one who has overcome, seated on David's throne, making our enemies a footstool beneath our feet, and we have this great hope. Of the war, name will prevail into the battle. Your name is breakthrough into the struggle. Your name is victory. Praises get louder, nothing can stop you. You hold the power. Jesus, you're the King. Let's declare a victorious warrior. Victorious warrior. Your eyes are like fire. come rushing with every word you speak and we have this great hope in the midst of the name will prevail into the battle your name is breakthrough into the struggle Jesus, you're the king, into the battle, your name is breakthrough, into the struggle, your name is victory, praises get louder, nothing can stop you, you hold the power, Jesus, you're the king. It's in your peace I find, it's in your strength I rise, it's just you Jesus, it's just you Jesus, you cast down every lie, your name is truth and life, it's just you Jesus, it's just you Jesus, it's in your peace I find. It's in your strength I rise. It's just you, Jesus. It's just you, Jesus. You cast down every lie. Your name is truth and life. It's just you, Jesus. Into the battle, your name is breakthrough. Into the struggle. Praise victory, praises get louder, nothing can stop you, you hold the power, Jesus you're the king, into the battle, your name is breakthrough, into the struggle, your name is victory. Praises get louder, nothing can stop you. You hold the power, Jesus, you're the King. One more time, into the battle, your name is breakthrough. Into 
the struggle. Dreams be free. Praises get louder. Nothing can stop you. You hold the power. Jesus, you're the key. Father, we are so grateful, Lord. You shout with joy. You shout in victory. Because you have the victory, Lord. We praise you and we thank you because you have already overcome. We have nothing to fear. We have nothing to be scared of because you have already overcome. So, Father, we praise you and we thank you because it is by your blood that we will triumph. It is by our testimony about you, Jesus, what we have done in our life that we will overcome. Father, we praise your name. We worship you. May we live our lives every single day for your glory, God. May we live our, our lives every single day in the fear of the Lord. To hold on to your hand, cling on to you, to fix our eyes on you as you lead us and as you guide us. So, Father, we pray that we declare that your blood is enough. Your blood has the power to deliver us from any struggle, to deliver us from any temptation, any bondage, any, anything that we're stuck in. Father, we believe that we will overcome by your blood, by your name. Jesus, you are victorious. So Lord, we praise you and we thank you. In all circumstances, we give you praise. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Thank you, Caleb. Okay, that concludes our Sunday worship and uh, Sunday service. So uh, Caleb, uh, Curtis, or anybody want any...